good Saturday morning to everyone. Hope everyone is doing okay. Um, give people a couple of minutes if I before I get started, and um, we'll uh, we'll discuss some things or I'll share some things with you on my heart today. Um, hope everybody's new year so far is going on and going along well. Good morning, Alexia. Hello, Shonda. What's going on, my brother Will? Man, I ain't seen you in a while, brother. I hope everything's going well with you, man. We need to, we need to definitely talk uh, and catch up on some things. Hello, Noel. Tracy, hello. Derek, what's going on? Good morning. Happy Saturday to everyone. John, what's going on, my brother Tip? Yuri, good morning, my brother. Lawan, what's happening? Yeah, early online. Got some things I need to get done. Got a lot of stuff going on today. Nicole, hello. Good morning, my sister. Lonel, bars. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah. So a couple things. Let me get to, let me get right to the to the announcements. BCV, BCV. You want to get any information or want to get merchandise uh, from me? Uh, want to purchase merchandise? Hoodies, hats, shirts, uh, whatever uh, that we have. Uh, you can inbox me. We will send you a picture catalog of our merchandise and um, get you set up with some uh, BCV gear, which stands for Book, Chapter, and Verse. Uh, if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can do that uh, first by liking the videos that I post here uh, and then also subscribing to my YouTube channel. Subscribe to my YouTube channel under my name. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, you'd like to sow into uh, this ministry. Uh, this is this is exactly what this is. This is a ministry to the body of Christ and for the body of Christ, uh, for the glory and kingdom of God. Uh, you can do that um, by going to uh, to Cash App, and my uh, profile name is the dollar sign and then Seiko Woods. You can uh, support it however the Lord leads you to do that as well. All right, so let me just get right into what I want to talk about today. And this is this is particularly uh, this is particularly for men. So. Ladies, if you are married, get your husbands. Get your husbands because this particular live is going to be for for the men, and it, it applies to whoever it applies to. Um, so when I when I share my live videos, of course, it is going through uh, things that I have experienced, uh, things that the Lord has put on my heart, things that I believe we need to give attention and, and awareness to. And so this particular topic. Uh, a title, Grape Nuts and Mary Kay Men. Now, if you understand what grape nuts are, you know that grape nuts, the cereal has no grapes and it has no nuts. So, correlate that to men who lack the testicular fortitude in being men. Mary Kay mentality or Mary Kay men um, I have not seen any men carrying or, you know, selling Mary Kay products. Anybody that basically uh, uh, carries Mary Kay products or promotes or, you know, um, sells Mary Kay products, most of I've seen are, are women. Uh, but there's an attitude, unfortunately, and my wife and I were talking about this this morning. It was with getting coffee. Uh, there's this attitude. There's this mentality going on in today's society where men are not being men. Men are not being men. They're not stepping up. They're not standing up. They're not being bold uh, in their homes. And if they're not being bold in their homes, they're not going to be bold in the household of God. And, and so that bothers me. That concerns me. It concerns me because as, as, the, as the head goes, so goes the body. And once the head is gone, then the body is out of whack. You, you cannot have... A body with no head. And so God has called those of us who are men to be leaders by default. Whether, whether listen, whether you are actively leading or passively leading, you are leading by default, man. You're leading by default. And unfortunately, some of you men really need to examine yourself when it comes to leadership. When it comes to being bold, when it comes to taking a stand against sin, 
against righteousness, against standing for the truth in this age of deception. And in fact, that's funny because that was actually one of the, uh, 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 that was one of the, the models that we had years ago. Uh, my, myself, Brother Sean Isaacs, Brother Tim uh, Butler, uh, Brother Rick Severa, uh, we, were, uh, we, we were a part of this ministry called Stand Up Ministry. And it was taking off very well, you know, but with, with, with things, how things go, you know, when you lack support, when you don't have the, you know, all the resources necessary, some things kind of like, you know, it, it, it dwindles and falls and falls away. But I was a part of that ministry years ago. And uh, I remember that uh, these men, these brothers that, were, that, were, that I was, you know, um, partnering with and, and standing locking on with. These brothers stood for the, the, the truth of God's word. They stood for righteousness. I mean, from different backgrounds, different walks of life. But we all came together under the under the banner of the cross and for the, the standard of truth that, that comes only from God's word. And this is this is a uh, this was a very unique group. We had one conference, I believe, back in, in 2007, I think it was, um, and and actually, this is the I just kind of want here. Uh, actually, we we had uh, we had people speaking. Myself had spoke. Uh, uh, Brother Sean Isaac has has spoken, and a couple other brothers had spoke. And one of the things I found that was unique about it: these were men. Th these were these weren't these. It wasn't this this passive milk toast, um, you know, cowardly. Uh, men that that didn't say what the Bible said. These men said what the Bible said, and they stood behind the cross and said, "This is what thus saith the Lord." And they didn't care about who liked it. They didn't care uh, how it would offend people. Uh, they were not concerned about popularity. They were not concerned about opinion polls. They were not concerned about whether or not they had followers or not. All they were concerned about. Was are were they faithful to the mission? Were they faithful to the gospel? Were they faithful to the preaching uh, of of God's word? Were they faithful in their homes and, and in their marriages? And 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 we're not talking about perfect men here. We're talking about men of men of clay, men who are made of dust, perishable men, but men nonetheless. Those days are gone. Very, very rare do you find men like that. I'm not saying that we don't have men like that. I'm saying it is very rare. Ladies, let me let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. If your husband is a man's man, you need to be laid out on the floor, prostrate before God, worshiping him. Not him, meaning the man, him, meaning God. You need to be praising and worshiping God that he gave you. He sent you a manly man. Because that breed of manhood, I don't see it in today's church. What I see in today's church, what I see in today's homes are the great nuts, are the Mary Kay men. That's what I see in today's homes and today's churches. I don't see men in today's homes and today's churches taking a stand for righteousness. And here's the reason why. Because see, the enemy is 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 running a good game on a lot of you men and having you think that being a manly man is menacing. Being a manly man should be mocked and ridiculed. Some of y'all remember back in the day, you know, when 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 shows like Good Times and 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 the Jeffersons and you know stuff like that. Even 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 uh Sanford and Son. I'm not I'm not I'm not agreeing with everything they did. I'm talking about the mentality you saw men. You didn't see this passive, effeminate, cowardly attitude among those men. James Evans was a man's man. Wasn't perfect. I know he was a character. But James Evans was a man's man. James Evans, when he came in the house, whatever was wrong, it was right by the time he got in there. He was respected in his house. 
He was even feared in his house. And I'm not talking about this hiding under the table, you know, abuse kind of fear. I'm not talking about that. There should be a respect and a fear of godly authority. That when your children do something wrong, they shouldn't have this lackadaisical attitude that, oh, ain't nothing going to happen. My dad ain't going to say nothing. And, and, you know, my, my, my dad ain't going to say nothing. My, you know, or, or, or some of these people, no, some of these kids not there. My old man ain't going to say nothing. I wish I would call my father my old man. I've never, ever in all of my years of childhood existence ever addressed my father, Lyman Joseph Woods, by his first name. I remember one time I did, and I don't remember anything happening after that. I, I don't remember you know, um, I, I don't recall, uh, you know, when I, when I did that one time, I, I don't remember anything else that happened after that. I, I think my mind went blur when I did that to him, um, uh, years ago. Um, but yeah, so anyway, but I don't remember that. I don't remember ever calling my, my dad, my old man. There, there was a, there was a high level of respect for who that man was when I was a kid. And thank God he's still alive. But James Evans was a man's man. George Jefferson was a man's man. And, and, and the fact that, you know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't weak. He wasn't, he wasn't a coward, you know. Uh, of course, they had worldly mindsets and worldly philosophies, but a man is a man is a man. And uh, say what you want even about Donald Trump. Let me, let me just touch on that for a second. Say, say what you want about... Donald Trump, if you want to, um, not telling you to vote for him, but I am telling you this. I am telling you this. Uh, we're called to pray for him. Uh, just like I prayed for President Obama when he was the uh, president, didn't vote for him in either in either election cycle, but I prayed for him. According to First Timothy, chapter two, verses one through four, I prayed for that man. But. Donald Trump. And Barack Obama, when it comes to manliness and being a man, I would I would ride with Trump when it comes to being a man as far as just taking a stand. I'm not talking about his morality. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being a man, saying what you mean, meaning what you say and carrying through on what you said you're going to do. Say what you want. Donald Trump ain't no bully. I mean, he's not he's not he's not to be bullied. Excuse me. I don't consider Donald Trump a bully. Uh, but he's not to be bullied or to be punked. Where are the men who are men? Where are the manly men? Where are the man's man at today? And, and this is why I call today's live Great Nuts and Mary Kay Men. Because I'm not seeing, especially especially since over the past few months, I would say three, four months, that I've been dealing with G. Craig Lewis and ABC, I, I, I'm not seeing a lot of manly men step up. I, I, I'm seeing a lot of women. I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, of godly women stepping up and doing stuff that men should be doing. But we want to we want to come against egalitarianism. We want to come against women, women pastors and women leading and teaching men. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the women are leading this movement. Don't believe me? Come here. Why do you think I put up the testimonies on my page? Why do you think I conduct interviews? Why do you think that? Because I'm trying to show the body of Christ. I'm trying to show the church and particularly men. Look who are stepping up. It should be, listen, listen, it should be us, the men, stepping up, guarding our homes, guarding our churches. You know, like Jack Phillips did. I think that's the, that's the brother's name, Jack Phillips. He met, he met aggression with greater aggression. He didn't let that shooter come in and just wipe out an entire church. He came strapped too. And unfortunately, two other lives were lost, but more lives would have been lost had not it been for God having a Jack Phillips there at that church. The enemy is picking off, spiritually speaking, he's sniping and picking off 
people in the body of Christ right now, and a lot of you men who claim to be men, are sitting back on the cowardly sidelines watching your wives, women, and children be collateral damage and falling by the enemy's tactics. And then some of you wonder why your wives don't respect you. Yeah, I'm taking a sip of my coffee on that. Some of you, some of you wonder why your wives not, do not respect you. Because it's hard for a woman of God to, res to respect a weak, cowardly man. I'm not justifying it, but I do understand. I do understand. I understand that it's hard for a woman to follow weakness. How is she the weaker vessel and she following somebody that's weak? God calls the wife, the woman, the weaker vessel. He doesn't call the man that's supposed to be leading the weaker vessel weak. But unfortunately, unfortunately, you have the weaker vessels leading those who are supposed to be leading the weaker vessels. And the sad thing about this is this. I'm seeing more of it happen. I'm seeing it more of it happen in my relationships with people who are supposed to be men, but they're not acting like it. I'm seeing I'm seeing based on testimonies, I'm seeing based on conversations with other women. And my wife can give it. My wife can attest to this. I'm not making none of this stuff up. I'm, I'm noticing and I'm, I'm observing I'm grievously observing how women are being affected by weak-willed men. Because weakness is, is an act of the will. It is. For, for the Christian, being weak is not a biblical option. Mm -mm. We're under biblical obligation, men, to be courageous. We're in the biblical obligation. We are, we are called and commanded to be strong. You, know, you think I'm making this up, don't you? I know y'all do. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Paul tells the church of Corinth. He says, be on the alert. Stand firm. Act like men. Be Strong. This is what the Bible says. See, 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 if you're not, if we as men, ladies, you just listen to this conversation. I'm talking to men. So you, 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 you can just, just listen in and maybe you can share this with your husband or share this video with him. Verse 13 of first Corinthians 16 are not suggestions, brothers. They're not if you don't mind being alert, if you don't mind standing firm in the faith, knowing what you believe and why you believe it and being ready, willing and able to believe and, and stand on the faith. Paul doesn't say um, act like men, men, if you feel like acting like men. Be strong, men, if you feel like being strong. No, 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 no. These are all imperatives and directives telling the church of Jesus Christ and particularly those of us who are men in the church of Jesus Christ, how we are to carry ourselves and how we are to function. Now, let me just say this. I understand we can have our moments of weakness because we see all throughout scripture that th those things kind of happening. We do. We, we see Moses having a moment of weakness. We see David have a moment of weakness. We see Abraham have a moment of weakness. We, 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 see, we see Paul have a moment of weakness. We see those that God has used mightily have moments. Listen to me. Moments of weakness. But it is not the manner and course of their life. And I'm going to tell you again, according to Scripture, 
being a coward will send you to hell, send me to hell, just like an adulterer, just like a liar, just like a thief, just like a slanderer or any other deed of the flesh that runs its course unrepentantly. Stop trying to highlight the big sins and we are not dealing with the quote unquote little sins that have taken root in our hearts and now is running our course of life. Stop it, man. Stop it. You want to talk about other stuff, but let's talk about the real issue. Let's talk about us as men. Let's talk about this great nut, Mary Kay mentality that has now emerged and has become pervasive in the church as a result of it becoming pervasive in our homes. Let's deal with that. Men, your wives want to follow you, but they don't want to follow you in a ditch. They don't want to, they don't want to follow no coward. And every woman that I talk to, every woman that I converse with, I'm talking about a real godly woman wants a real godly man. Don't believe me? Ask one. Ask one. And they'll tell you. And the moment they sense or sniff cowardice in you, their respect level comes down. Every, every moment that they observe, you see a threat. You see a threat, whether physically or spiritually. You cower. Their respect level of you diminishes. Now, listen, I'm not making excuses for it. I'm explaining to you why this happens. I'm not justifying their attitude. I am telling you it is precipitated because of what you do. And see, here's the thing. Yeah, they're going to be judged based on their attitude and actions. Yes, they will. But you know who else is going to be judged for causing them to sin? You and I will. See, we don't want to have these conversations. We, we want to have this, oh, let's just talk about love and grace. Listen, what I'm telling you, men, is loving. It's loving to tell brothers of the faith the truth. And see, some of you men don't, don't, don't like this style of manhood that I possess. And you know what? Deal with it. Because you need to have some men kick you in your spiritual behind and tell you to man the heck up. What you cowering for? What you crying for? What you whimpering and whining for? The enemy has taken your house and taken the church and some of you sit back and do nothing about it. And then, then those that do do something about it, you come at them as though that they're the enemy. See, this is how Satan got your mind. He has you thinking that manhood is just gentle. Let me tell you something. My, my dad, my dad taught me this. Listen, my dad taught me this years ago, and I praise God for that man. One of the things he taught me was this. He prayed this prayer, and, and, and I, I have adopted it in my own life. He said, he prayed when he was married. He said, Lord, teach me when I need to be hard and teach me when I need to be soft. In other words, my dad was saying, Lord, give me balance. Give me balance. Because if I'm too hard, I'm going to be a tyrant. And if I'm too soft, I'm going to be timid. So give me the Holy Spirit directed balance on how I am to deal with my wife, with my children, with my brethren. And my neighbor. Those four areas. If you're if you're married, your wife. If you're a parent, your children. If you're a fellow believer, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And just a human being, your neighbors. Lord, help me to have balance. Now, some of you 
think I don't have balance. I'm not, I don't have perfect balance, but for the most part, by God's holy grace, I strive to be balanced. I strive to apply 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I strive to do that in my life. Some of you don't need people to be soft with you. You need sternness. You need the spiritual spurs to be jabbed into your flesh for you to get moving. And it, re it requires discernment. So when I see in society, when I see in the church, this passive, weak, cowardly mentality, I see, I see effeminates. I see effeminity. Because I'm sitting back and I'm just watching and I'm saying to myself, Lord, what, what's, what's going on here? How is, it, how is it that we have a generation of cowards that are characterizing themselves as men? We have a generation of cowards that are chameleoning themselves as men. Ask the average man 50, 60, 70 years ago what they think about today's men, they will probably laugh. They probably laugh us to scorn. Why? Because they know that that's not what real men look like. Of course, God has a remnant. Yes, he does. He has a remnant. But unfortunately, the remnant is being eclipsed by the rest of these men who are not acting like men. They're really being cowards. And I'm just telling you as a fellow brother in Christ to other fellow brethren in Christ, you need to man up. When you see threats against your family, whether physical or, or, or spiritual, your wife shouldn't be coming to the defense. It should be you. It should be you testifying. It should be you exposing sin and error and wickedness wherever, wherever it looms. It shouldn't be your wife. Listen, even in my own home, somebody knocks on my door and I'm home, I go to the door. For the most part, unless I'm, unless I'm away from the house or something like that or outside or, or, or you know, gone inside somewhere, but for the most part, when somebody knock on that door, they're going to see a man at that door. Because I want them to see a male manly presence. That's how I was raised. I don't know how some of y'all was raised. I know when I, how I was raised. When that six foot four black man with muscles came to the door, whatever was on the other side of that door knew it was a real man at that door and in that house. Real talk. I, I'm not understanding this mentality today. Unfortunately, we have people like G. Craig Lewis basically running havoc amongst the people of God. And we have people that could step up, people that could speak up and stand up. They step back and lay down. They lay, they lay down like Sunday clothes. And that's a shame. And that, and that's and they really to be honest with you, that's a question of whether or not you're a real man, bro. I'm serious. And I'm not making no apology about what I've said thus far. Unless what I'm saying is sinful, you can show me book, chapter, and verse. I make no apology on how I'm talking to any of you or who are men watching this video right now. Not one. I make no apologies because I'm not making any apologies to make at all. When I read my Bible. I see God telling men to be strong and courageous. You know what, Loretta? <laughs> Your sister Sharon is just like that too. She, I mean, she, she's like, I'm, if my husband ain't home, I ain't answering the door. Leave a message or whatever. Now, and, and if she does, she, she, has, she has this on her hip. Just like I got mine right here. She has it, she has it at the ready. Just saying. But usually, nah, she ain't answering no door. She ain't answering no door. 
But back to my point, this, this mentality, when I see in scripture, is, 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 is rebuked. This, this, this cowardly, passive, weak, milk toast mentality in our men, God does not tolerate. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to give you some examples. And then I'm going to share a story with you. I'm going to share a personal story with you that happened to me as a young man. And I'm, and I'm going to show you why one of the reasons I am the way I am is because how I was raised. Um, but I'm going I'm to read some text real quick. Let me just read some text real quick. And, and, and then that way you, you'll see that I'm not making any of this stuff up and, and I'm not trying to, oh, he's up here being mean. Listen, get over yourself. Stop, stop that. Stop that weak stuff. All right. Let me read Joshua. Okay. Let me just read Joshua. And, and I'm going to show you how God commissioned a man to do something, even in the face of, of evil and in the face of conflict and looming threats. Joshua chapter one, verse I'll start at verse one. The text says, now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. Verse five, verse five. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I would not fail you or forsake you. Now, that last phrase, that I will never leave you or I will never fail you or forsake you, you can tie that over into Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Because the writer of Hebrews cites Joshua 1, verse 5 here, the C clause. The text says in verse 6, be strong. Here it is right here. here here's, the, here's the imperative. Be strong and and courageous. Listen, not just be strong, but let your strength be seen in how you handle conflict, how you respond to threats. Let me tell you something. You can talk about Trump all you want. You can talk about uh, 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 Jack Phillips all you want. I think that's his name. If it's not the, you know, the, the, the man who took down the shooter at the church in that church in Fort Worth, uh, just outside the Fort Worth area. But you can talk about these men all you want. These men are courageous because let me tell you something. Wars are not won. Conflicts are not resolved. Threats are not neutralized from cowards. These things are resolved, neutralized, and handled by courage. Cowards don't win battles. Those who have courage do. Cowards don't even resist assaults and resist oppression. But those who are courageous do. And notice what God is telling Joshua. He says, be strong, verse six, and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse eight, only be strong and very courageous. Notice what Jesus said. I mean, notice what the Lord says. To, to Joshua, twice so far, he tells Joshua to do something. You would think once is enough. God is emphasizing a point to Joshua. Joshua knows that his, his, that his leader, his mentor, is gone. God, who knows the hearts of his, of his people, knows that Joshua is probably scared. But he does not allow Joshua's fear to cause him not to finish a mission. 
Verse 8 says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it, from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. He said, this book, the law, verse eight, should not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Verse nine, the third time, the third time God says, have I not commanded you? You, you, you hear that daddy voice in, in, in your ear if you, if you use your sanctified imagination. What I just tell you, boy? That's how God is saying it, I believe. <laughs> he says, what did I just tell you? Verse nine, he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You do not have success in anything if God ain't in it. But if God is in it, he promises to give us success. And listen, success is not based on what you deem it to be. Success could be that nobody follows you. Success could be that nobody likes your videos. Nobody subscribes to your page. Nobody comes to your conference. Nobody comes to your church to hear you speak. But are you faithful? Are you doing whatever God's word commands us to do? And the first thing that God tells Joshua to do, he says, you got to deal with this fear, son. I know you're looking at the situation. I know you're looking at the enemies. I know you're looking at the, the, the problems facing you, but that's not the point. I'm telling you, I'm with you. He says, be strong and courageous. Three times God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous. Haven't I told you? Be strong and courageous. <laughs> So if God is telling us to do something, men, number one, he's already given us the ability to do. It. He's given us his spirit. And the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So any fear that we have ain't from God. The only fear we should have is holy, reverent fear of who God is. But the moment, the nanosecond that you and I start fearing man, fearing what they would do to us and imagining in our mind what could happen. You just put man on the throne. Instead of God. And that's idolatry. Whether you realize it or not. The psalmist says, David says, the Lord is my strength and my light. To whom shall I fear? He said, I'm not going to fear. What, what, what can man do to me? Jesus says, look, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but not the soul. He says, I'm going to tell you who you should fear. Read Matthew 10, verse 29. Read it. It's in the text. He says, fear the one who after killing the body can put both body and soul into hell. Yes, he says. Fear him. Some of you have your fear focus to the wrong person. Amen, Michelle. I don't fear any man. I don't. By God's holy grace, I don't. So when threats come my way, it just pisses me off even more to 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 because I know that that's the enemy using people trying to make me come down from the wall that God has set me up on. So like Nehemiah, Nehemiah had his foes, Sanballat and Tobias, and them. He had them trying to tell him to tell him to come down. And you know what the Bible says? While Nehemiah was building the wall, he was strapped too. See, some of y'all need to understand that being a Christian does not mean that we're cowards. Uh, some of us will lay you down. And I'm one of them. I will lay you prostrate. And it won't be before the Lord. Because I know what the enemy is trying to do. I see the Bible tells us that we're not to be ignorant of his devices. Some of you are so ignorant that you can't even see how the enemy is running your mind 
which is causing you now to run your house according to Satan's devices instead of the Savior's. And I'm saying it's a shame for those of us who are men. When our wives see weakness that you want to know, oh, she ain't following me. She's not she's not going to follow you when you're not following Christ. That's biblical, bro. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So the implication is this. If you're not following Christ, your wife is not going to follow you. Period. And she's not obligated to follow you when you're not following Christ. Sorry, if you thought that I was going to tell you to tell your wife, like G. Craig and so some of y'all who have mind screwed some of y'all and have pimped your mind, that you supposed to follow your husband wherever he goes, that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. You don't follow anybody who ain't following Christ. Oh, okay, okay. You want a verse? Okay. Okay, man. Do you want a verse? Okay. I'll show you verse, man. Do you think I'm playing? Okay. 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 All right. Philippians chapter three. Here's what the text says. Brethren, join in following my example. He's talking to the church at Philippi. He says, brethren, Join in following my example and observe those who walk. Notice, observe, follow and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. See, I'm not going to give you bias. I'm going to give you Bible. Because every time I power up this device and power up my life and I, and I come on. And I'm saying I'm talking for God. I better be talking for God. I better be saying what thus saith the Lord. If not, I need to shut up and sit down. Because I'm going to be held responsible for every word that I say once it's transmitted and it goes out into the airwaves. Because that's what the word of God says. James 3. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this, this mentality and this mindset Men, this mentality and this mindset that I see, unfortunately, that is emerged and is now pervasive in our homes and in the church needs to be shut down at the root. How do you do that, brother? How, how do you do that? I'm glad you asked. You do it through biblical accountability and biblical discipleship. But you know what? Those two things don't matter if a person is not teachable. See, it's a teachable spirit. It's a, it's a person who has a teachable spirit, a willingness to learn, a willingness to be told when they are wrong. A willingness to know that they don't have it all, that this whole manhood thing, you may not have been raised like I was raised or some of us who make up the remnant of biblical manhood have been raised. And so you're just winging it and you may be married and you're just winging this manhood thing. And God help you if you have boys and you're winging it because they're going to follow you. How are you leading them brothers? How are you leading your wives and your children? How are we leading our churches? If the home is weak, then so goes the church because the church is made up of homes that gather together. And so we have weak presentations of the gospel because we have weak representatives of it. That's why. And for the life of me, I cannot understand. And in the words of MC Light, I cram to understand how any of us who, ha who have copies of this holy book, who, who, by the way, I'll be debating that uh, somebody says I don't love it, but, but stay tuned. That, that'll be at two o'clock this, this afternoon, Central Standard Time, Facebook Live. Uh, how we have copies of this holy book and, and we don't apply it, but then we want our wives <laughs> to apply what applies to them? That's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. Sorry. 
straight up and down like six o'clock. It's hypocrisy. And and so some of you may get mad because I I I, I I'm calling you grape nuts and 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 Mary Kay men, but if the panties fit. If it fits, because like I said, I'm gonna hit dogs holler. You know, Paul when he wrote to the church at, in in in, uh, in Crete in Titus, he wrote to Titus. He says, uh, "Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons." He said this statement is true. You know, if I was a Cretan. And I had read that or had that letter read to me sitting in the church when Titus was reading that. Either one of two things would have happened. I would have been like, OK, well, he ain't talking to me. Because I'm not a liar. I'm not an evil beast. I'm not a lazy good. Or out of cop an attitude. How dare he talk about me like that? Well, see, that's you then. Because he can't only hit dogs holler. A general statement can be made about an issue. And if you find yourself bristling, you find yourself catching an attitude and feeling some kind of way by what I said, because I'm, I'm talking about grape nuts and Mary Kay men, then I'm talking to you. Just simple as that. But, but if, if, if this don't apply to you, you ain't going to trip about it. it Tammy, don't, give me, don't make me laugh. Softer than Keebler L's soft batch cookies. Lord have mercy. <laughs> It is what it is. And see, listen, when a woman says that about a man, see, it's, it's, listen, man, man, listen, ladies, excuse me, men, listen to me. Listen to me, men. Listen to me, men. When a woman says that about a man, that ain't good. That, listen, that's not good. It's not. Why? Because though they are the weaker vessel, they know what strength ought to look like. Listen, especially if they've been raised by a man that had strength, that exemplified and exuded strength and masculinity and biblical manhood. When a woman has been raised by a father who was a man's man, and then here you come acting weak, and timid and soft, man, listen, listen, it's one thing, it's one thing when a man calls a man weak, when a man calls a man timid, when a man calls a man soft. That's, that's one thing. But my goodness, when a woman calls you that, and look, and, and listen, and they're not calling you that because they're mad. Or they because they're trying to they're trying to you know they're trying to you know stir up anything. They're basing it on facts. They're basing it on actual information. No, Brooke, not ready yet. We already said two o'clock Central Standard Time, so stay tuned. Y'all say hello to Brooke. Let me finish my live, dog. This this is. This is an indictment. Lonel, don't <laughs> Yeah, 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 Lonel. Yeah, yeah. When a woman's fed up. I, I'm not going to be singing R. Kelly because we already know how, how we feel about him. But the, state, the sentiment is true. When a woman's fed up, there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing, I mean, really. So, so what, what, what am I saying here? What, what am I saying here? I read to you the Joshua passage, right? I read to you the Joshua passage, and 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 if you don't think that that's that's you know applicable, then then read Romans fifteen four. Read 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 Romans fifteen four. Because Paul says whatever were written in earlier times were written for our instruction, so that we through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures may have hope. So when we read the stories of Joshua, when we read the stories of, 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 about Gideon and, and, and about 
David and, and Moses and Elijah, all these men and even women of faith. We can we can draw from that. We can glean from that and say, wow, you know what? How does that apply to me? Lord? I mean, because it's, it's in here for a reason. You know, we can we can take we can take narratives and, and, and say, OK, Lord, you know, how, how, how can I how can I glean from that? How, how can I how can I take what this man or this woman has done that you have used and 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 and, and apply it to my life and to my situation? And by the spirit of God, he will do that when necessary. But what I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you guys, I'm telling you, brothers, I'm telling you, men, if you don't get your manhood in check, then you might as well just check out. And I'm not talking about killing yourself, nothing like that. I'm saying you might as well just, 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 just stop. Just sit to the side, man. Sit to the side until, until you can get your manhood up. Because if you're trying to engage in things and you're not manned up, you can get messed up. You you want you want to have Satan really mess your head up. This is why a lot of situations are going on, and the enemy has no resistance against it. And 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 the issue is not because oh you know you know the, the you know the, the the woman is not listening. No 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 no. Let's 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 focus on the head first. Because again, most women want to follow those who are following God. Of course, you're going to have your rebellious women. And, and, and of course, you're going to have even those Jezebels. And in and, and, and the truest biblical sense, you're going to have women who are wanting to rebel. But for the most part, women that I've talked to, women that my wife and I have, have had conversations with, they want to sit under godly leadership they want to sit under a godly man a godly husband but if you're not leading them you make it very hard for them to follow you especially when they see their home being ran by another man when they see the church being ran by weakness and that is the problem so what i'm talking about today i'm not talking just to be shooting stuff in the dark I'm speaking from personal observation. I'm speaking from firsthand information. And I'm just speaking straight up facts. I'm, I'm speaking from a place of objective reference. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you as graciously as I can as a man. What you're not going to get from me is this weak, effeminate approach to handling issues. If you think that I'm going to be soft with you when the enemy is picking off families, you come to the wrong place. I'm going to tell you to step aside and let the real man step in and let the real man handle the situation. So... Uh, When I was when I was in the military, actually, um, I joined the military when I was 17 years old. My dad had to sign me over because uh, I wasn't 18 yet. Actually, um, I graduated in uh, in 88. My birthday was in October, and so uh, I went to the uh, went to the naval recruiter, naval recruiter, and um, I wanted to join the navy. And the funny thing about it was, I wanted to join the Navy because I saw Top Gun. <laughs> I, I saw Top Gun. I said, "Man, I want, I want to fly. I want to fly a jet. I want to fly, you know, F F F fourteens. That's what I want to do." And so, in my crazy mind, like, that's it. I'm, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to the Navy, man. And so, uh, <laughs> little did I know that there are levels to that to, to those things, right? Hey, bro, I'm not dealing with you. you you're not, you, you not going to mess with me today. No, you're not. No, you're not. You, no, you're not. You're not going to do that with me. Y'all, see, April is a little sister that you be wanting to just, you know, uh, uh, take in a room and just, and just, and just him up. She's so, she's so petty. Me and her, we always joke all the time. But, uh, and she's talking about my Navy picture. Um, that I ain't put him in the mo. 
But I know probably Lonel, he probably got it in his archive. He'll probably pull up and be petty this long with April. But anyway, uh, so I wanted to join the Navy, right? And uh, I went to my dad and I said, hey, dad, you know, I, I, I think I want to go to the military. I want to go to the military. My dad's like, boy, you sure? And he said, uh, I said, yeah, dad, I, I think I want to go. And, and at first I was going to go to Pensacola Bible College. I'll never forget that place. Pensacola Bible College I was planning on going to. But I ended up just changing my mind. And so I said, uh, no, I think I want to go to the military. Dad. I said, but I, I can't I can't go unless you sign me over because I was underage. And so anyone under the age of 18 at that time, unless unless the rules have changed, uh, could not could not, you know, join the military. Right. So I never forget that neighbor recruiter came to the house, talked to my dad. And uh, told him, you know, what, you know, what I signed up for or what I was interested in signing up for. And my dad said, make sure, make sure that um, this is what you want, son. I said, oh, yeah, I said, I think, I, yeah, this is what I want. This is what I want. And so uh, I remember sitting in the living room with my dad and sitting at the table was the recruiter as well. And my dad, you know, he signed, he signed the papers. He signed the papers, you know, releasing me over to the government. And until I became 18, then I would be, you know, emancipated and be on my own. Right. Uh, that was September 26th, September 26th, uh, 1988 was when I actively joined the military, right? So I left and I went to Great Lakes, Illinois. Some of you know, if you military, if you Navy, you know, Great Lake, Middle, Great Lakes, Illinois, we used to call it the, we used to call it great mistakes <laughs> because when you got there, you're like, Lord, what have I got myself into? And I got there, I got there in October. And I went to Chicago. Now, I went there. All I had was sweatpants and a shirt. Because we were told, you know, when you get there, they're going to they're gonna give you all your stuff. Right. So I, I didn't I didn't bring anything. My dumb behind went to Illinois. Lord have mercy. When I tell you that wind was cutting through me like a Ginsu. And we had to stand at attention. And get processed in. Man, listen, I still remember that to this day. I still remember that to this day. But let me fast forward to my training, right? So in the Navy, of course, Navy, ship, water, swim, right? You had to know how to swim. So I uh, I remembered that I knew how to swim. And so when we had to go through these swimming drills, we had to go through swimming drills, I'm thinking, you know, I swim the way I'm supposed to want. I want to swim. No, 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 no. The instructor said, no, 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 no. You gonna swim the way we tell you to swim, and how we tell you to swim. So, I, I so we we stand up. It was in, it was, a, we was we stood up on the on the diving platform, right? And every every sailor had to jump off, had to jump off, right? And you had to jump off with your hands crossed like this. Step over the edge of the of the edge of the, uh, the, the the diving board. Recruit. Step forward. Recruit. Step off. Bam, stepped off, right? And we had to we had to fall into the water like this. And only until we hit the water could we let our hands off of our off of our chest, right? That wasn't the issue for me. I'm thinking like, man, please, okay. All right, we good, we good. I can do that, I can do that. Until I hit that water. I was like George Clinton. Never learn to swim. Never learn to swim. Never knew the rhythm of the stroke. Yeah, how could I hold my breath thinking I might choke? Yeah, when I hit that water and I thought I, I mean, I thought I was treading water like, you know, in a regular pool. Nah, nah, nah. Man, I got in the water, hit that, hit that, hit that, hit that water, came back up. They said, recruit. Tread, they, they, they showed us how to tread, how, how to tread too. But that was before you got into the water. So I'm thinking, hey, I can do that. I can do that. Man, I got in that water. I was trying to do that. And then I had to, I had to, you had to sit, you had to lay on your back, and then and then trade. Y'all know, y'all know the drill. If you've been in the in the, in the navy, and had to go through that those, those exercises. Didn't make it, and I'm going somewhere with this. So just bear with me. Didn't make it. So the uh, so the the uh, the, the uh, our, our company commander had the stick, had to bring this, had to put the stick out, put the pole out, drag me back, and I'm just like, <laughs> and I'm gonna be crying and stuff, man. I almost died, sir. I almost died. He's like, boy, you didn't die. You're, you're breathing right now, aren't you? Get off the deck. Get over here. And I'm, <laughs> I'm saying like, man, why are you yelling? First of all, you had to yell at me. But anyway, so I failed the first try. 
And so they told us. They told that's right. That's right, Lamar. For 15 minutes. No lie. 15. That seemed like 15 eternities. And so they told each recruit that failed, right? They said, listen, this is the Navy. Here you must learn how to swim in case you have to swim for your life. If you cannot make this, 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 these quali if, you, if you cannot make this qualification, we're going to have to send you back home. Now, mind you, at that time, I wasn't trying to go back home. But then when that man said, man, if you fail these, if you fail these exercises, you got three chances. This is your first one. You have two more tries. If you fail on the third one, we're going to have to send you back home. We have to, we're going to discharge you. And I said to myself, you know what, man, forget this. Man, forget this. I, I'm, I'm not doing it no more. And I remember calling my parents. And at the time, I had called my, I had called my, uh, my parents and, and, and my, uh, my stepmom and, and had answered the phone. And, and of course, she like, oh, baby, if you can't make it, we understand. And, and no shit. <laughs> being, being a typical mom, right? You're like, baby, if you can't make it, we understand. You need to try and all that kind of stuff. My dad, he, he wasn't, listen, he wasn't unloving toward me. But this is what he did. He heard what I had to say. I was like, I was like Dad, I can't do it. Dad, I can't do it. He's like, why can't you do it? Why can't you do it? And I thought I could swim, Dad. I can't swim. He said, he said, well, what happened? What's going on? And I told him. I said, I got two more tries, man. I, it's no sense me even trying to do this. I'm like, you know, I might as well just come home. This is what my dad shared with me. I remember, I remember we talked on the phone. And I remember this is when you got mail. Okay? This is when you got mail. I remember my my mom sending us or sending me a care package. You know, I had the cookies and all that kind of stuff in there, right? I had Oreos, I love the Oreos. And I uh, had the Oreos in there, had had some chips in there, and all that kind of stuff. And in that care package was a letter. And all that letter said, and I know my dad's handwriting, because my dad has some very distinct handwriting. He put in that care package. He told me that he loved me, but he cited this one verse. He cited Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. And during that time, I had already failed twice. So you got to imagine the pressure that I felt because I was like, man, you know, it's no sense to me even doing this. And I, and I failed both. I failed both attempts. I had one more. I had one more. And when I got that care package, I was on my last try, my last qualification try. And uh, got that care package, eating the cookies and everything, got the letter. And I remember in that letter that all my dad had said is that he loved me, praying for me. And he put in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. You need to read that. But I, I, I remember that verse to this day. The verse said, and it was in the King James, he says, it said, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. I remember that. And when I tell you something just came over me, I don't, I don't even think I, I, I thought I was a Christian then, but later in my life I, I became saved. But, but nonetheless, it was, it was God's, it was God's common grace through that saved father who knew that I was struggling as an 18 year old boy who wanted to give up, who wanted to quit because it was getting hard. And for me, that was a hard experience at that time in my life. But my dad did not want me to quit. My dad gave me the word. My mother was being compassionate. And my mother was being a mother. But my dad was being a man. And he knew that if I had punked out and if I had cowered, if I had caved in, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I thank this man to this day for that. That when he gave me that text, when he gave me that verse. That verse stuck with me for the rest of my life. When he said, if you faint. In the day of adversity, boy, that's, that can set the tone of your life. 
that this, this world is not going to be nice to you. That you're going to have to start standing up and stepping up like a man. And you're going to have to take some blows. Even if you cry, cry swinging. Cry standing up. Don't cry lay down. Don't cry and run. You stand. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you. You would have swore that I heard Rocky theme music. Come on. Because when I went to the third the third qualification. That 15 minutes. I just meditated. And I did everything that instructor told me to do. He told me to tread for the first few minutes. Like doggy paddle for the first few minutes. I was doing it. I was doing it. And of course during those times. You, you could practice before you do those, quali those qualifications. So that, that was all helpful. But I mean when I did that third qualification. That last one. I was in. And I was jumping in that water. And I was doing the doggy paddle. I was laying on my back doing that. And before I knew it, he said, recruit, stop, come to the edge. Came to the edge. I looked at him, looked at the recruiter. I mean, looked at the, uh, the uh, instructor. He says, well done, step out. And all that time I was meditating on Proverbs 2410. Proverbs 2410. Proverbs 2410. If you faint in the day of adversity, it's went too small. If I faint in the day, of, I made it personal. I made it personal. I said, if I faint in the day of adversity, my strength is small. If I faint in the day of adversity, my strength is small. But I also remember Proverbs, I also remember Isaiah 41 10, where he used to, right there, I used to always uh, cite, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Yeah, I will uphold thee with my righteous right hand. If thou faint in the day of adversity, my strength is small. If I faint in the day of adversity, my strength is small. I just kept meditating on it and saying it over and over and over, over and over and over again. It took a man to help me to be a man. Ladies, let me say this to you. If you have a real man in your life and you got boys in that house, I'm not going to say let them. I'm going to say God is telling you, let that man teach them boys how to be men. Because there's a real world out there and there's a real devil out there and he don't care and don't give a crap about your feelings. So I'm not going to say let them, let that man. No, no. I'm telling you, sister. You are under biblical obligation to let that man that you married raise them boys to be godly men. Yes, you can love on them. You can, you, can, you can show compassion to them and all that kind of stuff. When it's time to man up, when it's time to be a man, you better step aside. You better get out the way. You better get out the way. Because you could be a stumbling block and a hindrance to their development and manhood and growth if you are trying to tell your husband how to raise boys to be men. Listen, I got four girls in this house. Pray my strength in the Lord, y'all. Pray my strength. I can't teach them girls how to be a woman, how to be women. But you know who can? Sharon Renee Woods. That's why she's married to me. And that's why I'm married to her. They see what a man looks like, but they see what a woman is to look like. So they have both. And here's why Satan is trying to destroy the home. He does not want a man, a godly man and a godly woman in the home. You know what he wants. He wants the alphabet parents. He wants the alphabet people to make up the family. He don't want a biblical family to raise a biblical family. And so you have work to do. We all have work to do, men. Your job in mind is to raise godly seed. And to propel them out. Salvation is of the Lord. We know that. You can't save your children no more than you can save yourself. So we give our children, we give our families to God. Because he's the ultimate manufacturer of both anyway. If he gave us children, he gave us children for a reason. He didn't give us children as a tax write-off. He gave us children 
to raise in the fear and admonition of him. He gave us spouses so that we can show Christ in our leadership and submission to godly authority as women. And both, listen, both complement each other because some of you don't believe this, but men, you can submit to your wives too. I'm not talking about submitting to their authority. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. So you submit to your wives by being considerate of them. You Being a man does not mean that you don't listen. What that is, is being a fool. And some of us have been a fool for a pretty long time. Being a man means that, yes, the final decision rests on you, but not without consultation. Not without consideration. Because you are carrying your family to whatever decision that you make. So you would think that some of us as men would have a modicum of sense to say, wait a minute, let me, th let me talk to the wife about this. That's not weakness. That's wisdom. Why would I want to do anything and I know it can affect and not only can affect, it will affect whether positively or negatively my wife and children. Why would I do that? Why would I be inconsiderate of the one who is my helpmeet? Why would I be inconsiderate and thoughtless of people that I claim to love, but I don't consider? And, and it does not mean that there are not going to be hard decisions to be made. But I'm saying make the decision based on wisdom and based on wise, godly counsel. And then we trust God with the results. So that if it doesn't go the way that we prayed and planned, at least we went based on the information and wisdom and guidance and counsel and instruction that we received. Because we don't know what's going on around the corner. We don't know what's going to happen around the corner. All we can say is based on these factors and based on this scenario, I'm going to make a decision based on this. Honey, dear, baby, how do you see this? How, how, what, what do you see in this? Let me tell you all something. I ain't going to walk around the house talking about I'm the head. But... but that's obvious. A man that walks around talking about they the head, I'm the head of the house, I'm the man, I'm the man. No, you're not. No, you're not. You, 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 you're making up for some lack elsewhere. Because a real man knows what he is and know who he is, and so does a real woman know who you are and what you are. So well, you ain't got to walk around beating your chest talking about what you are. Just be who you be. And your wife and children will see that. So, I don't, I don't have to walk around saying any of that stuff. But the decisions that I make, the decisions that I make are not made apart from the woman that God gave me. It's just not. And in fact, the majority of the decisions that I made are made because of the woman that God gave me. Because I trust her. Ladies, let me ask you a question. We, we talk about this P31, P31 stuff, right? And I, I got I to gotta run. I got to run in a minute. Just, just bear with me. I got to run. But we, we talk about this P31, uh, P31 women. I, I want you to understand. I want you to understand that some of you have been given this P31 teaching coming from G. Craig Lewis and ABC that's been perverted. But just because it's been perverted does not mean that the scriptures that reflect Proverbs 31, P31, is perverted. It must be understood according to authorial intent. What do you mean? What did the writer say? And what did the writer mean by what he said? Does this, does this sound like you, ladies, sisters in the Lord, wives and women who want to be wives? When you read Proverbs 31, when you read verses 10 through the end of the chapter, 
One thing stands out to me. One thing stands out to me. Many things do, but one thing in particular that I always remember and reflect on is verse, excuse me, verse 10 and 11. An excellent wife or a virtuous woman who can find for her worth is far above rubies. Verse 11 is the key, is the key text for me. The heart of her husband trusts in her. Ladies, my sisters, can you say, can your husband say, listen, not, not, not with attitude or not when there's anger in his heart. I'm talking about when y'all have a godly relationship. Can that man say to anybody and especially to you, I trust you with everything I got. Because that's what verse 11 says. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Sisters, only you can answer that question and be honest with yourself. Brothers, if you have a wife like this, you need to be prostrating yourself before the Lord and thanking him for her. See, when we're grateful for what God has given to us, we won't be complaining and griping and fussing and cussing each other out. I'm just being honest with you. Come on, y'all. Let's just be real. Let's just be real. Let's just be real. Some of us got it good and we don't realize how good we got it. We, we don't even realize how good we got it. And sometimes God has to show us how good we got it and how good we have it by allowing some things to happen. Or sometimes he would give us... Um, he will show us examples from other people's lives. And I tell people this all the time. I, I, I tell this to my children. Experience is not always the best teacher. It's not. You don't want to be an experienced teaching learner. Because some experiences you don't need to have to know that something is true. I've never been on crack to know that crack is whack. Even before Whitney Houston said it, I knew that crack was whack. I don't have to be burned to know that fire is hot. I don't have to, I don't have to experience that. There are some things that you and I don't need to experience to know that it is true. And some of the things that we learn and some of the things we experience is because we're too dang on hard-headed. When we read in the Proverbs... When, when, when Solomon tells his son, my son, listen to me, listen to my instruction. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Why does Solomon say that? Because Solomon had a hard not life too, because he didn't listen. And some of us would do well to just listen to the lives of those that God has put in our life. Instead of saying, well, you know what? I mean, something that I've got to learn on my own. You know what? You sure right. You sure right. Yep. Some things you're going to have to learn on your own. The question is, are you able to accept what comes with learning things on your own, sir, ma'am? Because not everything is meant to be learned by experience. You don't have to go that route. And that's all I'm saying. So even in this situation here, when I'm talking about the men, when I talk about this grape nuts and, and Mary Kay men, you can change, but you have to be willing to change. But if you don't want to change because of fear, then get out the way. Because there's too, there, there's too many families and too many churches that are being destroyed by wolves, by spiritual terrorists, and those should be taking those who should be taking a stand are cowering. And I say that to your shame. I say that to every quote unquote man that allows the enemy to run his house and to run his church. And I'm just looking because I'm, I'm, I want you to see. The intensity behind what I'm saying. Man up. Stop allowing Satan 
to run your life and the life of the church. Brooke, I don't know what you're talking about because we scheduled the conversation at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, Brooke. Central Standard Time. Did you not get the information? We, we discussed it. Do I need to pull it up? Let me do that real quick. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pretty much done anyway. But let me just pull up this, this conversation that I had with, with Brooke. Brooke, look at your inbox. 2 p.m. Texas time would be better for me. That's what you said. I said, that's fine. 2 p.m. What time is it now, ladies and gentlemen? It's 11.39 a.m. Brooke, I know you're in Nigeria. I know you're seven, what is it, seven hours away? Seven hours from the time zone? You said... I said, this Saturday is the only Saturday that we'll be having this discussion. You said Saturday, 2 p.m. Then we have a fixture. I said the topic of the deck of the, of the debate will be Seiko Woods does not love the Bible. Your response. OK, perfect. On point. Good. I said, see you this Saturday at 2 p.m. On Facebook Live. You said till then be well and safe, brother. Now you respond at 1029 a.m. And says getting set. What are you getting set for? Brooke. What, what, what are you are you awake? Brooke. I have no problem going live with you, but it's gonna be at the time to where it is scheduled. Because I'm more than happy to oblige and I'm more than happy to have you respond to why you said I don't love this book. And so is everybody else. But not right now. So you're not distracting me. And like that. I just, wanted, I just wanted to call that out. Since this was in the live and you put that in the text format in, the, in this live. I want to make, make sure people understood it based on the receipts right here. That's what I do. I keep receipts, y'all. You know I keep receipts. Your boy keeps receipts over here. I keeps receipts. It ain't 2 p.m., Brooke. Okay? So I'll see you in a few hours. But it won't be right now. But feel free to watch and listen to, to the live right now. But we're not talking about that right now. Anyway, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. You pardoned. You pardoned. Synchronize your watch, though. Anyway, for me, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I wasn't made a man on my own. I was made a man by men and primarily my father, Lyman Joseph Woods. So for me, I know what manhood looks like. I understand what manhood is supposed to be. Imperfectly, yes. Imperfectly, yes. But manhood nonetheless. So, yeah. Unfortunately, there's a mentality. There is a mindset of manhood that has now crept into the church that has affected and infected people. And we must call it out and say what it is. And by the grace of God, I'm going to continue to do that. Whether it's a G. Craig Lewis or whether it's Greg Brady, I don't give a crap who you are. If it's threatening the church and if it's threatening families, you have my word based on the word of God as a fellow brother in Christ. I am going to call it out. I am going to make it known amongst the brethren. I will apply 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6. And pointing these things out to the brethren. I will do that. Until I can't do it anymore. Until God calls me home. 
or until he returns. But I want to remain faithful. And I want to be around faithful men. That's what I, this is just me. I, I, don't, I don't know about anybody else. I can't speak for anybody else. All I can speak for is Seiko Kenyatta Woods. That, that's it. I'm not into trying to make you something that only God can make you. I'm here to call you to accountability. I'm here to call you to do what God has called you to do, but I can't, I can't uh, make you do anything. Can't do that, but I can't call out what needs to be called out. So, um, stand with those who stand with stand on truth. But but if you if you are into this this mindset that you're gonna stand with people until it gets you know to the block gets hot, then you're not you're not faithful. You're not faithful, and you're and you're not needed for this type of battle. You know, Proverbs 20, verse 6, many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can, who can find a trustworthy man? Many people say that they die. Many people say that they that they're, they're right or die until Solomon says many a man proclaims his own loyalty. Oh, man, I'm, I'm man, I'm man, I'm a right or die dude until until he says, but who can find a trustworthy, a faithful man? Not that many out there, y'all. Not that many manly men out there. So it's time to man up. Time to man up. So anyway, but I'm about to get off this live. Um, I'll be be on another live this afternoon with uh, Brooke Femi Newby, um, discussing why I don't love the Bible. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what evidence he has and. Uh, Hopefully, um, this this conversation will end, you know, fairly well, and and he'll uh, he'll repent. If not, this is gonna be a quick one, quick and Tyson's knockout. But anyway, love you all. Y'all know the drill. Whatever you do, do all to the glory and honor of God. God bless. See you in a few hours.